Thank you, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, back up here again. Uh, we've been having a number of these panels, and we hope this one will be very practical for all of you, and uh, hopefully will sort of demystify some of the issues with AD treatment initiation and monitoring. And I think the first couple of slides, Dr. Glick, you're gonna, we're gonna start us off. Oh, wait a minute, I think I jumped ahead here when I give you. Sure. Well, thanks so much, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So atopic dermatitis, and I, when we did this as cases, we talk about initiation of therapy and monitoring, but I'm gonna present a couple of my cases and uh, my colleagues here can chime in. So this is a 51-year-old white male, 20-year history of atopic dermatitis. His first seen a number of years ago, well, 25% uh, BSA, an IgA4, so it's pretty severe atopic dermatitis, numeric rating score about eight over 10, um, face, neck, antecubital, popliteal fossa, elbows, knees, a lot of areas involvement, a really, um, really severe AD around his eyes, uh, disruptive to his life as well, like kinification, only sleeps about four to five hours a night, and he's very photosensitive um, when he's golfing. Uh, here's Mark, and you saw on that first slide, uh, all these subjects have given their permission in a typical HIPAA compliant fashion for me to be able to present this, by the way. So you see these areas of erythema and scale across the face. Here's a lot of lichenification about his periocular region. Here's a close up of the same. And he's really uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily clinically look that bad, but he's really uncomfortable. Um, he has background allergic rhinitis. He's had atopic dermatitis for 20 years. The areas involvement I discuss. He's taking Dr. Friedman's favorite medication, an antihistamine for atopic dermatitis. Uh, sorry, I just had to do that. Uh, allergies to dust, mold, and pollen, and then his most notable laboratory abnormalities just have an elevated Ig level at 923. So in year one, he only wanted topical therapy. You know, we discussed in, in a lot of the panel discussions and even throughout this meeting the challenges of dealing with patients who want what they want when it may be kind of even against their or our better judgment. Uh, he's failed innumerable topical corticosteroids, but nevertheless, this is what I initiated initially, uh, which is desoxymethasone, 0.25 cream, twice daily uh, for the trunk and extremities, and pomicrolimus um, uh, twice a day, uh, also for the, for the face with a little desinide cream uh, on the face as well, too, mostly for the weekend use, and so I'd have some rotational therapy. So, you know, about four to six weeks later, he has very minimal improvement. He's really not doing very much better. He's got new areas of involvement on the chest and back. And so the next question is, what do you do? That's me. Well, I mean, meaning like, you know, what do you do when you have a really challenging case? So, I, yeah, that's me. Sometimes I have struggles. So you, you call in a couple of brainiacs. That's what you do. You call in your friends. I mean, you need help. So, um, you know, that's what I'll do here. So. Um, I would just stop there and so, you know, what, 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 what do you do in this situation, Adam? What do you, what do, you do with this patient? A lot, a lot of facial involvement, he's really uncomfortable. Yeah, so I, I think there are a couple of things and probably it starts with questions. Um, so, you know, you have on a pretty rigorous topical regimen. How adherent is he to it? Um, I think one of the biggest handcuffs is the fact that he only wants topicals. Now, to that, I would ask him what his understanding of the disease is because I think there's this perception that atopic dermatitis is a skin-only problem. It's a you problem for the skin, but it's actually a systemic disease. And so sometimes giving patients perceptive that this is a systemic problem that needs a systemic solution may help redirect. You may have had this conversation with him, but I probably, when I hear, oh, I only want creams, that's kind of how I address it. I'll say, all right, we need to think about this globally and why putting a patch on a big problem, a Band-Aid on a gushing wound is not going to cover it. So that's one. Two would be I'd kind of go into how he's using those topicals. Maybe if he's really adamant about topicals only, I, I would up class in terms of give him a class one potent topical steroid. Um, even I'll use those. I know it's sacrilege, say face and groin. That's okay. You can do that for a couple days. That's not a problem. And see if I can, with optimization of topical therapy, being sure he's adherent to it, maybe that helps. Then the flip side is, are we calling this the right thing? And I have no doubt in my mind that you have diagnosed this correctly, um, but is this AD or is it AD plus contact, especially with the facial involvement? Is there a, and that's why this guy is here. I was, I was here. waiting, because when, when, oh, yeah. when we I'm not gonna David. steal your thunder, but something to think about. Um, 
So I think it's more, I would ask a lot of questions and see if we need to optimize, if I can convince him that he's not thinking about this the right way. And from there, then we start to think about our options that I would argue need to work quickly for this guy. So what are things that work fast? You know, intramuscular oral steroids as a bridge to something else, cyclosporin, jack inhibitors, they're gonna kick in very quickly. But you know, depending on his feelings, access, things like that, you may wanna bridge into something that's more long-term like one of the biologics too. Well, we're going to get there. Your, your thoughts here. I, 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 like those, I like those thoughts. You know, when I see a lot of head and neck disease, uh, I might ask him, uh, any way you know how to make this worse? It's kind of a comment that I make. Do, do you have any sense as to what make you better? But how would you make it worse if I asked you to do that? And maybe he would go out in the sun, it sounds like. Uh, he has exacerbations in the sun. I sent this guy to rheumatology. I mean, you can't put everything uh, in a case like this. Send him to rheumatology. He's worked up. For, you know, I thought, man, maybe I'm missing lupus here. He's super photosensitive. Other photosensitive uh, conditions may be uh, erythropoietic protoporphyria. Um, but um, he had a lot of those workups. And on David, he was also patch tested too. Right, so I, 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 I'm certainly biased in that regard, but I, I'd probably go to patch testing very early on. Um, and if it's a head and neck predominant disease, I, I might consider he have cr chronic actinic dermatitis, which is eczema, but it's a sun allergy in the simplest terms, right? And those you miss every time early on in the workup. It's not until the clothes come off and you go, huh, it's kind of sharply demarcated at the neck. Maybe he's got a little on his dorsal hands. He tells me when he goes outside, he's getting worse. Um, now, how do we work that up? I, I might do minimum erythema dose testing to UVA and UVB. You might not have access to that, and you might just make that presumption that that's the case. And topical corticosteroids, fine. And by the way, I like, this is a personal thing that I do, but when someone wants just topicals and they're on steroids, I said, I didn't realize you were into such risky uh, type of treatment behavior, right? It's like, what do you mean? You can put steroids on your face and around your eyes, and that's going to have issues not only physically with your appearance like acne, but you'll increase your risk of glaucoma and cataracts, and it's probably not the best therapy. I would think you might be interested in safer therapies and longer-term therapies. And it's like, well, what do you mean? Maybe I mean a biologic drug, which can do more. Maybe I mean using topical tacrolimus, pimacrolimus, chrysoboral, and certainly now topical ruxolitinib in what seems to be limited surface area, way below the labeled issues with it. So, all right, it, I think well, you Well, what I was, what was, uh, I, I, was, I love I was that passive in aggressive there. statement, by the way. Off there. I love that. But, um, but uh, you know, he's, he's got more involvement than just his head and neck. I mean, he's got involvement of his extremities, uh, his trunk as well, too. So, you know, I'll, I'll jump in and just, you know, move this a little bit along. I did culture him. He had positive culture for heavy growth of staph. And so he was, you know, had a lot of sleeplessness. His condition was getting worse. And so I put him on systemic steroids. I also gave him a... Uh, a taper of steroids and, and put them on tacrolimus, uh, added that in, uh, mostly for actually the trunk and extremities, not so much for around his face, and added some doxycycline. And, and, and don't ask, yeah, I tried crystal boro and it burned. <laughs> tried. It happens, I tried, like my sad face. About a month later, he flared again, no new areas, but the patient was again uncomfortable frustrated, his BSA is a little bit less, but he's just, he's out of control. Trunk, extremities, his face is still really bad. And so he, he finally agreed to be a little bit more aggressive and steroids really turned him around. I mean, I really didn't mention that, but about, about two, three weeks into the steroids and he's got my cell number at this point. He's a really nice guy, we both like golf. And, and so he sends me a text and says, I'm miserable. So I put him, check some labs and I put him on Michael Phenolate Moffatel. Of course, I reinitiated steroids at the time of, of, of utilizing that. Um, I guess about four to six weeks in, he, he stabilized. His skin, skin improved overall. His sleep was a lot better. He was actually a little bit more uncomfortable on the golf course, and his IgA is now down to a two. His decreased BSA, it's just a little bit more manageable. But what happened after about a year and a half of being on uh, Michael Phenolate Moffatel, his face and his arms started flaring, um, really bad itching, kind of back to baseline. So what now? So um, first of all, I gotta say, before the age of biologics and ED, Michael Phenolate was my go-to. I mean, it was kind of like the baby aspirin of immunosuppressants. You're not as worried about it. Slow to start, but it works, and it really did. 
So in this setting where a patient's doing well and all of a sudden they're not, my two first thoughts are, A, back to the original conversation, contact derm, because these medicines, maybe they'll mute, but for the most part, they're not gonna stop in larger contact dermatitis. Number two, is it something else? And I mean, there's it brought in the literature of atopic derm looking things, or even atopic dermatitis, that damn blaze to CTCL, I would be worried about that as well. Though I'm not sure about the data on mycophenolate pushing it, but we just know really bad atopic derm can at some point explode. Um, and so maybe I'd wonder about, is there something else going on that would require multiple biopsies to get to the bottom of it? Yeah, uh, what do we have for biopsies on him? Yeah, um, uh, t the typical spongiotic dermatitis. Um, he has not had gene rearrangement uh, tests, but that might be of consideration. I, I think if you're getting multiple biopsies that are spongiotic dermatitis, I think there's good satisfaction to that. Um, my my go-to has always been cyclosporin because uh, of the speed of onset and uh, the comfort in, in knowing the, the adverse eff effects of that that are very easy to monitor like blood pressure and blood tests. And, you know, th there are many surprises from the use of cyclosporin, uh, methotrexate, or, or mycophenolate, which are all in the guidelines of care uh, from AAD back to 2014. So they're all good choices. I think in the last, you know, few years, five years plus, um, I'm pretty quick to the trigger with uh, biologic like dupilumab. So, you know, if we go back to the original history, although, as always, in, on, on the podium here, we're trying to move quickly, he's needle-phobic, right? So it, it took me a while to eventually to con convince him uh, a number of times to even give him an IM injection of Kenalog, and I gave it to him myself. But as you can see here, he actually started getting some renal function issues, and uh, I basically took him off of mycophenolate, and I finally convinced him to go on dupilumab. Um, so I put him on dupilumab, Within three months, he did see some significant improvement, and he was happy. But, B-U-T-T-T-T-T, after about six months, he started flaring a little bit again, and also his hair started falling out. Um, at the same time, he had been complaining a little bit to me that his eyes were a little bit itchy, a little bit gritty. They were redder, so I sent him to ophthalmology who confirmed that he had conjunctivitis. Note that despite the conjunctivitis, he was still pretty happy, and he wanted to remain on therapy. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I, I did... Um, I did think about trying ruxolitinib, and, and I did use ruxolitinib because I'm fast forwarding here. Um, it did help some, but not enough. It really helped a lot in this phase, but really not enough in total. So, so here's Mark, and you know, you can see now, this is now, he's got conjunctivitis, still a lot of periocular changes, and um, popliteal fossa on the arms, um, some papulation on his upper extremities. There's a lot of activity on the posterior cervical region. Um, affecting his ears, um, I think his eyes, what were bothering him the most, and not just intraocularly, but, but, but also periocularly. So for me, what, what I did here, it's kind of time to stop dupey, and I, because um, I'm fast forwarding, you know, three or four years very quickly here, in what I think is a pretty interesting case. Um, and uh, considering the approval of uh, two Janus kinase inhibitors earlier this year, I actually just about four months ago started upatacitinib, 15 milligrams daily. Of course, I checked labs ahead of time, as you see there, and we've had a bunch of discussion on that. And about three months into therapy, his skin is almost completely clear. In the first month, his itch really went down to almost zero. Um, and then eventually zero. I've seen him back uh, a few times since we initiated therapy. His face has been the best it's ever been. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a test case for really the confirmation of the diagnosis too, just saying. Uh, although you did give me some concerns about CTCL. No, I, I, you know, the CTCL, and you'll see in a couple of slides, it's always in the back of our mind. If you go back to that slide, you see that sharp cutoff at the neck, that would reinforce me to work up the chronic actinic dermatitis. Yeah. Now having said that, what would I do if it was positive? Exactly what you did, right? So it would just be diagnostic in that point. Um, maybe biopsy the back of his neck. It's very hard to-, to David, what would that work up be? What would that, you know, kind of even actinic work up? You talked before about, you know, some uh, MED uh, type of uh, testing. So the, the, the MED is what, like off, often what we do before we start phototherapy. We check the minimum dose of UV light necessary to burn. You. And if I put everyone out there in the Las Vegas sun, there's going to be some point where we all start to turn red. 
but that dose can vary from 30 seconds out there unprotected to maybe 20 minutes. So that dose is pretty well established as a mean bell curve for every skin type from one to, to five, right? And uh, in there, you're, you're expecting, okay, maybe 100 millijoules of UBB gonna make you red or uh, 80 joules of UVA, and all of a sudden his could be two joules of UVA, in which case these really bright lights would make me red and give me <laughs> eczema, right? And, and so that happens. Now you happen to pick a good therapy that I might pick for chronic actinic dermatitis, but that sharp cutoff at the neck was very suspicious to me. Yeah. I guess I, and he's out in the sun playing golf a yeah. fair amount, a couple of days a week. So one thing I want to go is back to the path and see if there are any necrotic keratinocytes, because that, not always, but that could sometimes help push you towards chronic actinic dermatitis versus just a pure sponge. It could be just one or two, and the germ path may be, oh, well, they're, it's Florida. They're outside. They're just going to be there anyway. So maybe they didn't even notice it. But now with that in mind, they can actually look and say, well, you know what? There are some sunburn cells. Yeah, and, and, and there was eczema there, not just, re Correct. Not just a sunburn. So, Correct. you know, the other thing is if you're, if you're in a, a circumstance, it's like, where am I going to get an MED A and B, right? Unless you're in a major metropolitan center, and I would say half the major metropolitan centers, you can't get an MED A or B. You could still notate that there's sharp cutoff in sun exposed areas, protected areas are less involved. There's a suspicion of that. The biopsy did or didn't show that, and we're proceeding with treatment w that could be photo aggravated eczematous dermatitis, and, and you've got it covered. It's just that neck, you know, made my hair stand up a little bit when I saw that. But the treatment would be very similar. And the thing, the thing is, is that, you know, he's got his t shirt on. So you can see where his golf shirt yeah. uh, ends right there, too, when he's golfing, because that's where he's getting most of his sun exposure. And hydroxychloroquine in these circumstances may be helpful, um, and very broad spectrum sunblocks. Those are additional treatments you might consider when you're photo aggravated. The, the other thing I'd throw out there is hydroxychloroquine, which has been shown to decrease sensitivity to the sun. So I'll treat this as an eczematous process, but I also use Plaquenil, and yeah. that does help them kind of protect from a, you don't take out the sunscreen and all that stuff, but it adds an extra no. level of protection. Yeah, f five milligrams per kilo or less, and you just monitor them, get them to the eye doctor before, uh, just to, to demonstrate that there's no baseline issues, and then um, every six to 12 months after that. Want to move on to the next one? Okay. We will. So this is a six-year-old, uh, my patient for quite some time, who's had um, uh, AD for quite some time and managed primarily with um, topical corticosteroids. Pretty much everyone, you name it, miserable all the time. You can see that picture. Uh, more periocular disease, a lot of excoriations even on the face. Um, she's tried all the TCIs as well. Oh, however, correction, I, um, you know, th there was one topical corticosteroid that she did use that was desinide foam, and that actually helped a little bit. And again, uh, don't ask. Uh, I tried crisoboral and it burned. So I'm um, sorry to crisoboral. It doesn't always work for me. So these are some clinical photos. Obviously, there's some gluteal involvement. We have neck involvement again. She's not a golfer. Um, the oracles are involved too. Her hands are involved. Super uncomfortable. Poor thing. A lot of excoriations, secondary bacterial infections. This is what she looks like when she comes in the clinic. She's tired all the time. This young lady, her parents actually at one point kept her out of school for about six months. So it, do, it does happen. So, you know, what do you do right now? What would you do right now? Used all the topical corticosteroids. You said she's, you said she's six? She's six. I, I, I would go straight to dupilumab. Right. Uh, that would have been my thing. I, so if this was eight, eight, ten years ago, I would have done cyclosporin, flipped her to meth methotrexate, and just kept it going as long as I could. Now, again, low bar for me um, because the worry factors are so s small, right? I write tremendous amounts of cyclosporin and methotrexate over my career with much less lately, but, you know, I, I, I might have just even before the label would have written a letter of medical necessity. To so I, I did. Yeah. You <laughs> I did. So, you know, I, I met this young lady. She's 11 now. So um, I met her about four years ago. Sorry for the, the lack of timeline, but it's, it's part of telling the story, too. Um, you know, 
there's no question that we're so blessed to have these drugs and now down to the age of six months. But I'm really not a big Psychosporin fan for the, for the kiddos, although I know it works very well. Um, I, I tried pr uh, prednisolone a couple of times, and it was very helpful because um, she had never tried it before. I did a couple of trials of that, and it did cool her down, but it just came back, and it came back wor worse. And I actually started methotrexate, about 7.5 milligrams with folic acid, about a milligram per kilogram, um, except on the day she was taking methotrexate. And it was actually really helpful, but unfortunately, when she was taking it, uh, even with food, um, even with H2 blockers on board, she, she had a lot of GI upset, and so I ended up discontinuing methotrexate. So, you know, here's how her disease progresses. Again, I don't think this one really is questionable on the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis and feel kind of really bad for this young lady. Just more clinical photos, excoriations, worry about secondary bacterial infections and even sometimes eczema herpeticum, particularly with the periocular lesions. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not moving so great. Miserable again, can't sleep. Okay, now, so, so now what? And, you really kind of said it already, David. I actually, this was way back. I, I kind of reached out to Rob Sidbury here, um, who was very helpful and instructive, is a, a wonderful pediatric dermatologist. And so I started her on dupilumab. It was empiric at that time. We really weren't sure what the exact dosing regimen was going to be. So I started her on 300 milligrams. And we used about two thirds of a syringe because we only had the 300 milligram syringe at the time. Improvement was noted uh, just at week four, week eight, and she's maintained continued improvement really along the way. Uh, ultimately, as we got closer to improvement down to her age, and um, I guess we, I don't know, remember the timing of what it was. I mean, she's six here now, so maybe about um, seven or eight years old, uh, we got her right dosing regimen uh, based on her age and weight as you see it there, when it was approved for six to 11. It wasn't so easy, uh, me giving her her first shot in the, in the office. Uh, we do have a buzzy bee, so that helps too, and the parents have one at home as well. Yeah, so, yeah, I know, this, this is just some, some, I'll follow, do some follow pictures. This is her on Dupixin. She's pretty happy. I'm almost done. Those are all the pictures of her. That's her now. She's 11. Those are all the creams that she's used over her lifetime. <laughs> So there you go, David. Thank and I'm sorry I took up no, a lot no, of time. No, no, they're very uh, informative cases. Uh, that that last one, in particular. So let me just barrel through these. These are so th these. This is a chart from the guidelines of care. This will certainly be changing over the next year or two, but uh, you see cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine, uh, mycophenolate, all top choices for systemic therapy. Phototherapy up there. Let's not forget it, home phototherapy can be really helpful for patients. But in, in re recently, we've gotten, we have four systemic therapies. I mentioned a little earlier that um, patients don't always present to us in nice, neat silos. They don't say, I they don't have an AD sticker on their forehead or a psoriasis <laughs> sticker. And there's a lot of overlap between psoriasiform, dermatitis. I'm just gonna mention the thing that, uh, how can you make a mistake, right? You can make a mistake by saying, I think it's eczema and it's psoriasis, and you give a therapy and maybe it gets a little worse, or the vice versa, it's, you think it's psoriasis, it's eczematous, maybe they don't get better, maybe they get a little bit better and you have to think about it, or one of those therapies suppresses the complicating part, the psoriasiform part kind of goes down and the eczema is there for you, or vice versa. We don't want to miss MF, so you look for those classic signs, like couple of lesions on the buttocks that just look strange with that atrophy. Do, do a few biopsies. And you know, if I'm getting two and three biopsies that are spongiotic dermatitis, I feel like I have freedom to operate and move ahead. I'd also note, look for sun protected areas. This is a sun sensitive disease. Remember we treat with UVB. So it loves the hip girdle, especially in Florida. It's gonna love the hip girdle because everything else is just exposed to way too much sun. And then there are the stranger disorders like pityriasis ruba pilaris that kind of look like seborrheic dermatitis. And over the course of weeks and months, they shower down and are kind of resistant. And I found great utility in IL-23 inhibitors in some of these patients, whereas before, our biggest guns would do practically nothing for it. So how do you make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis for a clinical trial or for our offices? I don't put this down in my note. It's just in my head 
the Hannafin criteria. They are internationally accepted criteria for the diagnosis of AD. And I think we all generally agree that these are very important. So we have patient reported itching, typical morphologic location, just like Adam said, it should be, you know, not in, it should be everywhere and not just in sun protected areas. Flexural in adults, extensor and facial in kids chronic and relapsing, and a personal history of atopic disease. You need three of those, right? Three of those you can get right out of the history. Family history, personal history, one bullet. Chronic and relapsing, one bullet. Itching, and one bullet. The other two are physical exam. And then you need three or more of any of these. I could probably find three of these on both the guys <laughs> on the panel right now. but. You see, you can, you can look around and find these things. And look, notice conjunctivitis is the third bullet, is a diagnostic criteria, but also not an uncommon adverse effect in biologic drugs. Uh, any thoughts, guys, on just in general looking at this? I think it's a guide. Yeah, I think that's the point. There's no biomarker. There's no biopsy blood test that will tell you this. That's why you need to know what's essential, what's an important criteria to make the diagnosis, but also to ensure you don't make a misdiagnosis. And, and, and some things to put in your notes that you may viscerally not want to put in your notes, but I promise you, you will be writing less and being more meaningful if you use some of these things. The numerical rating score for itch. Dr. Glick had it in his note, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a validated system on a, z, on a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being the worst itch, itch you can imagine and zero being none. Where, where is your itch score right now? Now, that's gonna, you're going to get a score that's always going to be lower than in the last 24 hours, what's the itchiest you would describe, which is the W, worst NRS score. And then the global, the glo the global assessment is very vernacular. You get to pick that, right? You get to decide. They're clear. They're almost clear or mild. Moderate, moderate to severe and severe, right? When you start patients with systemic drugs, they need to be threes and fours, and you get to decide that. And I, this is a real note, right? 26-year-old presents for eczema. She has childhood eczema, no food allergies, has asthma and seasonal allergies. I've clicked my first box and her dad and sister have eczema. I mentioned some things she used. I mentioned her numerical rating score for itch. I happen to always ask about psoriasis and bowel disease and arthritis because I'm never sure what I'm gonna see. And I'd like to know if there's a, you know, there may be someone like, you know, my mother has terrible dandruff and um, my grandmother has so something called psoriatic arthritis. It may make my physical exam look a little bit differently. And in her physical exam, it's very brief. Erythema score out of four, scale crust score out of four, lichenification score out of four. I decided on an IgA, I put a BSA. Very brief, but any one of you in the audience can cover me in my office three months from now and walk in and expect to know what she looked like. And in July, and I picked this as I was preparing for the meeting, Right? I always indicate the start dates, and I carry it in every note. I can never remember when people started, and then I'm flipping through. When was it? 19 or 17 or 18? When did you do it? It's at the top of every note. This is when they started it. Not having any problems with it. Their NRS itch scores have gone down. And look, they're nearly clear. The IgA is down to 1. The body surface area is 1 to 2%. And I'm sure I make my staff very happy when they need to get prior authorizations by just bulleting this stuff out. This is someone I saw recently. She happened to have eczema and had a weird rash that I biopsied, came back lichen planus. She was convinced it was from her COVID shot. I said, well, it's, po it's possible, and it completely went away without me doing any really major treatment. But look at her February 18 score versus her July 2022 score. There's unquestionable improvement um, her results speak for themselves, and I'm not being wordy. Erythematous scaly and lichenified plaques on the head, neck, back, chest, and then the follow-up is fewer erythematous scaling and excoriated plaques. What does that mean, and how do you articulate that, Adam? Yeah, no, I think 
if you guys didn't get a photo of that for your charts, please make sure you're following that. I mean, just purely from a practical standpoint, I would be shocked if any payer rejects your request for medications with that. You've covered everything, and you've done it before they've even asked for it. So I think we have to be proactive and prophylactic with respect to how we document and what we actually document to avoid those phone calls, the 15 faxes I mentioned before. So that is a great formula, and it's a shared language. You said anyone walks in there, they know what the patient looked like based on what you wrote. Sure as heck is uh, helpful for approvals, too, for getting drugs, big and, time. And, and the note is never a, more than a page. It, it's not eight pages of right. just junk, right? So just on the panel, it, what do we have, a, a, a minute or two? Uh, any IGAs, NRS scores, BSAs that provoke you to go systemic? So for me, it's more a PROs. Is a patient sleeping? How bad is their itch? Are they not having a social life? Are they burning work? Missing school? Those to me, granted, I document those. Those are what the insurance want to look for. But that is what dictates more the three or fours rather than the whole body. Someone could have just one focal area, but they can't do anything. That upscores it to me. Yeah, if, if someone indicates to me an NRS itch score of seven, eight, or nine, I, I tell my, the residents and the students, if someone tells you a nine or 10, that's a proverbial grabbing you by the lapels and pushing you up against the wall and saying, you better do something for me and do it soon. Um, just some broad strokes here. I start with biologic drugs to start. I generally use dupilumab because it's been around for a long time. I frequently will flip to trilokinumab if I'm getting a lot of head and neck disease or resistance. It doesn't mean you can't go right to a JAK inhibitor. I'm certainly relegating the small molecules within the guidelines of care way down on the list, whereas before they were way up on the list. Um, and I'm getting baseline bloods even before biologics because I want to be facile to switch to something in between visits and not have to slow things down. So you've heard many times in this program, CBC, LFTs, I think you get lipids because if you see high lipids before, you have no <laughs> idea what they were. High lipids a month or two into a JAK inhibitor, what does that tell you? It makes no sense. Right? Um, sometimes if they're older and higher risk, I'll get a CPK. Um, I might have a, I'll, I'll skip this now, but putting these things out there, you know, possible HIV pregnancy test. Zoster vaccination is FDA approved down to age 18 if the patient is immunosuppressed either by disease or by medication. You don't need a much of an excuse to push for Zoster vaccination. It could be done on therapy. Yeah, I agree. I think the bigger question is how do we follow? And I just took a note from what was out there online, probably from the website itself, with respect to uh, you know, other JAK inhibitors, and I've been doing that, but I think we'll start to see some more information related to this patient population, because we're talking about monitoring for RA patients. AD patients, AA patients, very different, and their risks are different. So I'm certainly following the day 0, 30, and every three months, I think we're gonna see a big change in what we're monitoring over time, but I've been following the historic approaches. I agree, I, I think baseline at a month and every two to three, three months. Keep in mind, we hear a lot of discussion about sicker groups having these severe adverse effects. Those AEs occurred in the AD trials, not just the RA trials, not just the UC trials. The AD trials had those events occur. You have to stay on top of that and pick your patients, you know, wisely, right? Okay, Joe. That was fantastic. Shout Thank you all. That was really good.